We are uh, going to jump into the reading just in a second. I want to introduce what we're going to be doing for a couple of weeks. Uh, starting on September 11th, we are going to be restarting our narrative lectionary, which is a fancy word for our schedule of stories that we're going to be following from September all the way to May, bringing us from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis all the way to the end of the Bible. We just did this last year, and we picked up certain stories along the way, and we're going to do it again, picking up different stories along the way. And the reason we do this is because it's really important to have a sort of an overarching understanding of how the whole Bible works together. How does the story of God's people progress from the beginning to the end? And so that's why we're going to do this. But for the next two weeks, we're going to be kind of introducing a couple of topics before we jump into the whole Bible. And we're going to use the same scripture this week and next week. It's from 2 Timothy, uh, and it's all about how God's word, the tr- scriptures, are worthy of our uh, use in teaching uh, and in, in, in worship and in all aspects of our life, that God's uh, scriptures are an important part of our life together. There are a couple of things I think are really important that I wanted to touch on before we got into the narrative lectionary, and this week I'll be focusing on the Old Testament, especially the question about, like, who is the God of the Old Testament? And then next week, we'll talk about the New Testament, particularly about the miracles and the healing stories, and what do we do with those 2,000 years later? So that's kind of the gist of what we're going to be doing for a couple of weeks, introducing uh, the Bible as a whole, and then jumping in from beginning to end. Roger, take it away. Thank you so much for reading this morning. Good morning. Our reading this morning does come from 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, verses 10 through 17. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and my suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. The word of the Lord. It's always great to have a debut puppet performance. Thank you, Bob. Good job. And that, was that a goat that you were? Yeah, that chicken and goat knew a lot of things about the Bible. Um, So, like I said, we're going to be diving into the Old Testament, particularly this morning as a preparation before we start reading stories from the Old Testament. And I've been around the church my whole life, and I've talked to a lot of church people in my life, and there's one thing that I've come to learn from most church people I've ever talked to. It's that we don't know always what to do with the Old Testament, especially the way the Old Testament describes God. Nod your head if you think that sounds right. Like, we don't always know what to do with all of these stories from the Old Testament. Like, we might read the Psalms, some of the Psalms, at least the good ones, and we might tell children stories from the Old Testament, put them in little picture books, even though the stories are a little bit disturbing. We do like to put them in picture books, like flooding the whole earth. That's, you know, that's pretty intense. 
So we will do that, but we as adults don't always dive into the Old Testament and read it and try to think about what it's telling us about God and who we are. In fact, when we open our Bibles, most church people I know skip right on ahead to Jesus. We love Jesus. We want to hear stories about Jesus. Jesus is our guy. And so three quarters of our Bible just sort of get left behind. I kind of want to change that this morning uh, because this isn't a new phenomenon. This has actually been going on since the beginning of Christianity. Uh, There was a pretty famous theologian in the second century. His name was Marcion. And Marcion uh, also felt this way about the Old Testament. When he looked at the Old Testament, he, he, he thought he saw not the God of the New Testament that's loving and kind. When he looked at the Old Testament, he thought that God was sort of violent and judgmental and angry and even mean sometimes. And so Marcion had this great idea. Well, I'll make my own Bible. And so he took a scissors and he cut the Old Testament right out of it. In fact, he started chopping up the New Testament too to sort of support his emerging theology. And this was his theology. And it was very popular in the second century. That the God of the Old Testament was not the same God of the New Testament. In fact, there were two gods. And the God of the Old Testament was sort of like the bad God of the earth and all the things that are wrong in the world. And the God of the New Testament was sort of like the good God, the superior God, the God Jesus calls Father. So this has been going on since the beginning. We've not known what to do with the Old Testament. Even in the 16th century, when Martin Luther was writing, he uh, made a translation of the Old Testament, and he wrote in the preface to it that many people in his era have no idea what to do with the Old Testament and think very lowly of its status in comparison to the New Testament. These things aren't new. So it's been going on a while. Now, you probably are not at home using a scissors on your Bible, hopefully. <laughs> let's, let's hope so. But my guess is that at times in your life, you have cut the Old Testament out of your devotional life or the things you prefer to read. Uh, when I was a new pastor, I was guilty of this too. Uh, in a lot of churches, you'll hear four readings of Scripture on a Sunday morning. You'll hear an Old Testament and a psalm, and a New Testament, and a gospel. And you always have this choice as a pastor which one you want to preach on. And for like the first two years of being a pastor, I never once preached on the Old Testament because I just preferred to talk about Jesus. Then again, why does it matter, right? Why should we read the Old Testament? As Christians, isn't the point of our faith following Jesus? So shouldn't we just read the stories about Jesus? Well, one of the things that I like to talk about, and I've talked about in sermons before, and I'll talk about forever, is something I think is really important to remember whenever we're discussing Jesus and the Scriptures. It's that to remember that Jesus himself was Jewish. And Jesus saw himself through the lens of his Jewish faith and the Hebrew scriptures, right? He claimed to be the Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus is constantly quoting and referring to the Old Testament. Because for him, that was the way to know who he was. He was so impressive in his use of the Old Testament, even temple teachers were astounded by what Jesus taught. It is sort of clear to me, I think, that the best way to understand who Jesus is, is to understand who the God of the Old Testament is. And there are so many things about Jesus that we think are sort of quintessentially and uniquely Jesus. Like Jesus invented some things. And there's a really famous thing that Jesus said that a lot of people talk about still today. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. It's this great Jesus stuff, but guess what? He ripped that right out of the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your hearts from Deuteronomy and love your neighbor as yourself is from Leviticus. 
So one of the best ways to really understand who Jesus is, what his mission is, what his status, his unique status is, is to see it through the lens of the Hebrew Bible, to understand the kind of God in those pages and why that God would eventually send a son into our world. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to deal with three common hang-ups that people have about the Old Testament. And I know these are truly hang-ups because people have been telling me about them forever, including my own mother. So this is very important. And so I'll try to kind of reframe these concepts, um, give you a little bit of things to think about, and hopefully leave you here with a little bit of a bigger perspective on how you might approach some of these parts of the Old Testament. And I want to start with the first one, which is the exclusivity of the Old Testament. This one trips up a lot of people in my age group, I've noticed particularly. A lot of people struggle with this, that the Old Testament revolves primarily around one small group of human beings in the ancient world, the Israelites. And it revolves so much around them that at some times it is at the expense of or even the demise of other groups of people. Israel has this special status with God in the Old Testament. But people often wonder, why would God do that? Why would God choose one group of people rather than the whole world. Didn't God create the whole world? How fair is it to create all these people, but then choose one small group of people to focus on and give all your blessings to? But this is something that we get wrong all the time, and even the Israelites themselves got wrong a lot of the times and had to be corrected in the Old Testament. And that is that God did not choose to only bless the Israelites. Instead, God chose to bless the world through the Israelites. Now, that maybe doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but it is a big deal. It's the scope of what God is trying to accomplish in the Old Testament isn't just to save this one small group of people, but it's to save the whole world through this group of people. God chose, for whatever reason to pick this family, Abraham and Sarah and their descendants, and through them they would bless the nations of the earth. It's a strange plan, and I don't always claim to understand why God did that. And it's maybe not a plan that we might expect a God to do, right? To put so much of of this reliance on the promise on human beings, but that's what God chose. It's the kind of relationship God wanted to have with this creation. And so what comes after Genesis are all these stories of how that plan played out. How God tried to bless the world through these messy, broken human beings in this messy, broken world. And sometimes they just plain mess it up. Which brings me to my second hang up. And this one I think is the biggest one that I've heard in my life, which is that the Old Testament is just too violent. Right? The Old Testament tells all these violent stories, and for a lot of people, they just don't make sense with the kind of way that they've been taught to think about God as this loving, generous, caring Father in heaven. So how can that square with all the stories of violence in the Old Testament? The thing that I'd like to point your attention to, or at least have you think about this morning, is the Bible doesn't just tell us stories about God. The Bible isn't just some theological document that is like page after page of insights about God. The Bible primarily tells the real story of human beings, especially ancient Israel, in a real world. And it's sort of this document of how those people lived their life and tried to negotiate what that life was like with God. The other thing that's really important to know about the violence is to also remember the history of Israel and try to contextualize it in that way. 
we often think of Israel as like this great thing, right? Because if you've been in church your whole life, you've been talking about Israel your whole life. But on like an actual historical perspective, Israel is just like a blip on the radar. Israel is this tiny little country, and I only have geographical references to North Dakota, where I came from. And so if you know anything about North Dakota, Israel's like as long as it is from Fargo to Grand Forks, and whatever it is here from 70 miles from here. It's a short country, and it's skinny, and it was surrounded by huge countries, the ones you actually learn about in your history classes, like Egypt and Assyria, and Babylon, these massive empires that just loved asserting their power, overtaking groups of people, and going to war. And Israel was this tiny little highway right in the middle of all that. Which I'm basically trying to tell you is that Israel had no other choice than to live in a world of violence. They were oftentimes the victims of these larger superpowers' desires. And in their small little world, they also tried to find ways to survive. And one of those ways was with violence. But the thing that has helped me along the way is that a lot of the stories that the Israelites tell in the Old Testament are oftentimes exaggerated. Right? You have to ima- like, try to put yourself in this position of this tiny little country trying to make your way in this world. And the stories you tell about uh, how powerful you are and how powerful your God is and how much you can do on your own, oftentimes you do start to exaggerate. And we know they exaggerated because there's times in the Bible where we'll say the Israelites wiped out this whole group of people. And then just a couple chapters later, that group of people is still there. It sort of doesn't make sense, other than to say that at times in the Bible, the violence is exaggerated. And that was sort of a normal thing to do in history as well. Some more things I want to say about violence. Another theological way to think about violence in the Old Testament is to recognize that not all the violence was sort of like within God's control. And uh, when somebody pointed this out to me, it like blew my mind. Um, It comes from uh, the book of Zechariah. And listen to how God talks about the violence that's happening and what God's part in all of it was. God says, I'm extremely angry with the nations that are at ease, these big superpowers. For while I was only a little angry, they made the disaster worse. Right? Well, I wanted just a little bit of justice. Well, I was going to have uh, some armies come in and maybe shape some things up. They took it to the extreme. So some of the violence in Scripture is not describing what God intended for there to happen in the Old Testament, but were the, like, the makings and dreamings of human beings and their lust for violence. I have a few more things to say about violence. One of the most important things also to understand about violent language in the Old Testament is to remember who Israel is and to remember that we are really not the same as Israel. If you're like me, you were born in the greatest military superpower this world has ever known, right? When our country makes threats, it can usually cash those checks very easily, Israel was a tiny victim of violence for countless centuries. And so there are at times in the Bible uh, language of extreme violence that is not meant to be taken literally, that God would do this horrible act of violence on behalf of Israel, but is sort of the longings of victims who feel powerless. They're sort of like crafting this harsh vision of a future because that's the only way they can seem to find hope. All right, one more thing to say about violence. The last thing I'll say about violence in the Old Testament is that violence is just a part of life. You and I both know this, right? Even today, a country like Russia can just 
invade another country like Ukraine on a whim, causing unimaginable pain and suffering for human beings. And this has been going on since the beginning. Our world is violent. Our lives are broken and messy. And the question that I think the Bible is trying to wrestle with is how do we find God in the midst of that? In this world of violence, this world of pain and suffering, where is God? And who are we, the people of God, in this world? And what are we called to be like and to do? So those are all my thoughts on the violence of the Old Testament, and I could talk more about it. Let me know if you want to. Let's go to the last one, the last hang-up people have about the Old Testament. Uh, and, and, and this one is some people's favorite, and most Lutherans don't like it, um, and that is the wrath of God. That the Bible, especially the Old Testament, just seems so angry and mean. And it sort of conjures up visions for us of those like hellfire and brimstone preachers. You know, if I could do it, I would do it. Not that I don't think I can get away with that. But this like idea that God is so angry and vicious and mean that we just have to live our lives in fear. And so a lot of people reject the anger of God and don't want to read the Old Testament because they don't want to experience and feel that anger. But here's my sort of perspective change for you, if you want it, this morning. And that is this. What kind of God would have no anger? Like, what kind of God would look down on this world at all the injustice all the suffering that we cause each other, all the exploitation of the poor, all the senseless violence, and would feel nothing, and would do nothing. Is that a God worthy of our praise? See, I think God cares so much about this world and the people in it that God gets angry when we mess it up. And God gets especially angry in the Old Testament about the way that God's people treat each other, especially people like the widow or the orphan or the immigrant. You hear this over and over in the Old Testament. God cares so much of those people. It makes God angry when we exploit them and cast them aside. But the Old Testament teaches us something unique about the God we follow, and that is that God isn't just angry, but God is also merciful. Psalm 30 describes God's anger this way, for God's anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Rather than burning it to the ground every time the human beings messed up, you know, stuff that gods might do, God chooses every time to keep working with these messy, broken people, trying to give them a future with hope. And there's this catchphrase in the Old Testament. I'm sure you've heard it before, and it's going to show up in our readings throughout the year. It's something unique about the kind of God that we worship, Not a vengeful or wrathful or violent God, but a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. One of my favorite stories in the whole Bible is a story about a guy named Jonah, who you might remember was in a fish at the bottom of the sea. Uh, The reason he went to the fish is because God told him to go to Nineveh, a place Jonah hated, Jonah's bitterest enemies go to Nineveh and tell them that I'm going to destroy them. So Jonah goes the other way and gets in a fish, and God eventually gets him to do it. And long story short, God doesn't destroy them. Instead, the Bible says it like this, when God saw what they did, the Ninevites, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And because Jonah is a human being, because Jonah hated Nineveh, because Jonah could not get that 
hatred out of his heart, he says in the whiniest tone you can ever imagine, For I knew you were a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. There's the catchphrase again. Except this time it's not a reverent word about God, but a bitter complaint complaining that God is not angry, mean, judgmental, or violent enough. God has a way of surprising us. On September 11th, we're going to embark on another year of walking through the Bible together. And my hope for you as we do this is that you'll be surprised. These aren't kids' stories. We don't know everything there is to know about each of these moments in Israel's history. These are important stories that help us wrestle with what it means to be a human being in this messy and broken and violent world. And what it means that we always have this creative, surprising, compassionate, and committed God with us along the way. And by the time we get to the New Testament sometime in December, I hope that for you it will be obvious that this God is the exact kind of God who would enter into this mess with us by sending His Son to live among us, to teach us how to love, and to die and rise again, to set us free and save us. Amen.